You're listening to the Ad Racers Lounge. Are right, you going to mute again or just go? Welcome to the iRacers Lounge. I'm your host, Kyle Fleischman. iRacers Lounge is a podcast for the iRacer where we talk all or we talk all things iRacing in a casual setting. Joining me tonight, Chewy Side 55, Carlos Fonseca, Dave Smith, and special guest John Hammer. Welcome, guys. Evening. Thanks for having me. Oh, no problem. We're going to start with you tonight, John. And uh, when did you start on iRacing and how did you hear about it? Well, it's a funny story, actually. Um, I was a PlayStation guy for years. I had a PlayStation 2 forever. And a friend of mine that I worked with was a fan of racing. And uh, one day uh, he said to me, you ever heard of iRacing? And I said, no. He goes, well, how are you a NASCAR fan? And I'm a NASCAR fan and I know about it and you don't. So in October of two, or let's see, no, it was uh, December of 2011. He stopped by my house and brought over a laptop. It was a MacBook Pro at the time. It had an HDI, HDMI on it and we plugged it into my TV. So I got this killer TV and uh, uh, clips, tower speakers and everything. We plugged it in and knocked most of the stuff off of the walls. So I started uh, racing about then. <laughs> And, uh, and I did the three-month trial, and I've been on basically since January, February, March of 2011, so five years. Never looked back. Wow, nice. That's, uh, that's a different story than we've heard here before. That's crazy. Uh, how often do you race? I really don't race anymore. I, the only racing I'm really doing, actually, is in the GT1 car, uh, the Corvette over in the... Uh, the GT1 series, sometimes I'll race the B car or the Gen 6, but I'm really not um, a driver anymore. I'm, I'm a team manager, a co-owner, and a chief engineer and crew chief. Oh, wow. Okay. So while well, we were just talking about that, um, what team are you owner of? I'm one of the seven owners of No Excuses Racing. I've been around since 2011. Oh, okay. Sweet. So, uh, when you are racing, what kind of a uh, wheel and pedal are you using? I started out on the, um, not the G27, the other one, the cheaper one. But my wife actually hooked me up with a G27, and um, I just use a basic G27. I'm on a single 24-inch uh, 144 monitor, but I have a supercomputer, basically, so it's a little bit funny. I built a computer though, ridiculous with, um, I run Crossfire with two R9 290s so I could do streaming and have a lot of opportunity for that kind of stuff. Huh. Uh, uh. I think the wheel that you were referring to is the Driving Force GT. Yep, that's it. Uh, not a bad upgrade to the G27, and I, I use one myself, so that's the wrong one. I wore out the brake pedal or the throttle that I had to short calibrate it. <laughs> so I was down to like a half a pedal. Oh, wow. I, sh I should mention that I didn't even build this supercomputer until like 2015. I got earned most of my I rating on a MacBook Pro, a 17 inch MacBook Pro that I still use from 2009. I used wow. boot camp. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um,. How about any third-party software? Well, being a crew chief and an engineer, and I should put a disclaimer, I'm, my engineering, quote-unquote, comes from books and just experience. I, I don't have any degrees and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not a physics guru. I'm not, I'm not any of that kind of thing, but I've learned a lot. But um, we use MoTeC and Atlas. Uh, some of the guys on the team use the Z1. There's all kinds of stuff getting used, but... I have some other programs that I use too, some actual programming programs in Python. Okay. And uh, what's your most memorable iRacing moment? 
Well, I had two. The mo I'll talk about the most recent one because it's pretty cool. The um, in the forums actually, I made a post asking about um, some tire telemetry that I didn't think was right, honestly, and it was based on a misinterpretation of an F1 video that I saw, and it turned into like a 23-page <laughs> boondoggle, but I spent a lot of time, probably two hours, going back and editing all of my incorrect parts of my post. Dave Kamer was the second reply, and a lot of people that I know that have been here a long time said that that was really cool. Most definitely. I know that you're uh, quite active on the forums. I've seen your name on there a few times. I don't personally scroll them a whole lot, but it, it, just, it seems like when I do, I see your name around a lot. So I know you're pretty active in there. Yeah, not as much as I used to be, but I try to help when I can, especially telemetry. Right. Now, the, the main reason why I wanted to get you on the show is to talk a little bit about team ownership. So how about you tell us about that and uh, what that kind of stuff entails? So really, um, hopefully most of this is not about me and mostly about our team because it's really, uh, I think, a early adopter. Esports coming in, not necessarily to iRacing, but to sim racing. And I've only been sim racing since 2011. So I'm late coming to the game, but hopefully early adopter um, with the rest of my co-owners on the team. So what we did is um, we weren't originally a, a business. We were a team just like anybody else when we ran whatever paints we wanted and all this other stuff. But I worked for a company, Malone and McBroom, who's a sponsor of ours. And uh, I remember when they went through their process of um, protecting their copywriting, their brand, and all of that, and the logo, and it's quite a process. But for us, I, I looked at that, and I was like, you know, anybody could take our team name. Anybody could, you know, basically mimic us, and that's really not good. And the other thing that we had going on was a lot of what I call fake paints or pirate paints, and teams, not teams speak, but um, trading paints is famous for mimicking whatever paint that you want. So, you know, I had this idea with uh, the previous owner, Johnny Machalchuk. Uh, sorry if I got his name wrong. His name's so hard to pronounce. <laughs> but um, him and Derek Gleason were the two original owners with a couple other people. Johnny was the original owner. And I said, you know, we got an opportunity here. We could be pretty cutting edge and turn the team into an actual business. Derek's a, a certified um a CPA. So with Derek as a CPA and Johnny in Michigan area and myself kind of managing the team, I'm, I manage the team more or less with some help. We opened it up to the entire team to become an owner. Now, you know, we're it's not like we're making a fortune here. We're, we're really not. It's really not the goal. It's important to understand the goal was to protect the team, to protect the brand, to actually have to um, market the brand and the team to real sponsors. So what we've been able to do in, in short is set the table as one of the first um, licensed businesses, I think in sim racing as a team, at least on iRacing. I know Apex Racing is as well, Matt Dalton and his group. But So we've done that, we're a licensed business, we're an LLC, it's No Excuses Racing LLC. All of those paints that we run are actual sponsors. They may not be giving us, um, you know, cash checks and stuff, but they give us value. And like the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite, for example, um, some of the sponsors pay for our TeamSpeak. You know, they pay, they contribute in various ways, but it allows us to be legal, and we can be on any broadcast without any problems, which is a really big thing. So just. To elaborate a little on the team, there's 34 members on the team. There's probably about 15 active. So. Oh wow. Okay. Well, I know that ours, Mike uh, Ellis, is our team owner, and we operate under Typhosi Solutions LLC. It's his business. So. 
I'm not sure. I know there's a lot of race teams out there. I'd be curious to know if others actually run under the same uh, format. Yeah, you don't see or hear a lot about it. I mean, there's people who think it's really a good idea, but way ahead of its time. But it's kind of my thing. So um, it, it's it's a cool deal. I think it's uh, pretty unique, and I'm I'm really proud of our guys for. Um, making it happen we actually had to you know you have to hold meetings you have to you know have uh paperwork you know signed and everything and an actual agreement and it's it's been really cool a difficult at times and it's caused some problems but overall i think it's been really cool well that's really awesome all right, well, we're going to get into the rest of the show here. I, I thank you for joining us, and you're welcome to jump in on any topics that we discussed tonight. Yeah, I'd just like, if you don't mind, to throw a cap the hat off here to the co-owners on the team, um, Brian Bennett, Tom Harris, Johnny and Benny Holloway, uh, Mike Campbell, and uh, Derek Gleason. Uh, all of the guys on the team, if they hear this, are a huge asset to the team the Carter brothers, um, Greg Gurk. I mean, I could go on. There's 15, 20 guys on this team that are a really phenomenal asset. And at this point, I, I just managed the team, and I couldn't do any of this without them. So I really appreciate all the work they do and appreciate you guys having me on here. Yeah, no problem. I've run with uh, quite a few of those guys myself, both on console and uh, iRacing. So good group of guys you got over there. Oh, thanks again. All right, so next up we're going to talk about the NASCAR iRacing.com Pro Series that ran, well, it would probably be two weeks ago now, and it was at Auto Club. Um, talk about mine real quick. I qualified for the race and then got to talking with my teammates and team speak and completely forgot to sign up for the actual race. I remember that. So... Um, most people know I live stream all my race, my uh, races for NIS and the Pro Series, so I ended up spotting for a teammate EOL. Um, for this race, and uh, I don't have much experience with it, but I did thoroughly enjoy it, and uh, I think he ended up finishing up seventh. I spotted for Scotty. Um, Dave Thompson was in that race, another teammate. He had his live spotter, Mel Morris, with her with him. And I think they ended up finishing 13th, if I'm not mistaken. But um, all in all, it was a it was an all right race. There was a lot of wrecking in that race, which we haven't been seeing in our split a whole lot towards the beginning of this uh, Pro Series. But uh, Dave, did you run the Pro Series at Auto Club? And how'd you do if you did? Yeah, I ran the race. I didn't uh, didn't show up with the setup. I was very happy with, but. Uh... What I lacked in setup, I had in willpower and effort and kept on working on the car throughout the the race, which wasn't very long. And uh, I was like a 20th place car, and I kept on working on it and finally got it to where I was moving up into the top five. And we had some people that forgot how to drive and ran each other over. And I got collected in it and ended up finishing like 36, seven laps down. Oh, tough, tough, tough. Jeez. Uh, yeah, Car what happens when people forget how to drive? <laughs> yeah, true story. Carlos, did you run the Pro Series at Auto Club? I can't remember if you're Yeah, running. I did. And how'd you do? Uh, I don't remember. Like 14th place, I think, 15th? Oh, there was a, some of that was because there was a, a huge one, you know, big wreck. Took out quite a bit of cars, and I got to see the tail end of it from my point of view. And there was a guy flipping. I'm actually showing that right now from the replay point of view. Guy just flipped because someone tagged him. But it all started with uh, some guy had to get off the throttle, and it just started from there. Someone didn't check up in time, and everyone wrecked. And I was way back in 40th place, and just. Waited for all the carnage, and I eventually got up to the top 20, I guess. And oh just, my, that was one hell of a barrel roll he did. <laughs> oh yeah. 
but ended up finishing 15th, I think. Um, let's see, I looked into that, really. I was running 18th, but there was these guys with about three or four to go. I think it was three to go. They were racing so hard next to each other, and I, for some reason, decided to go, like, two car lengths below the apron to get away from everyone, and they wrecked next to me. Wow. Now, if I hadn't done that, I would have been wrecked. Yeah. So just a bad decision that ended up being a good decision and <laughs> saved my ass there and I got me a 15th and about the setup. Car was actually not bad once it got going. Oh, I, I surprised myself how good it was. It's just, what do you do? You race as hard as you can because it's a 100 lap race or do you wait for them to wreck? Right. And that's true. what I did. <laughs> Now, uh, Dave, have you been tra tracking where you're standing in the points at all? I mean, I know you don't have any aspirations of actually making this Pro Series, but how are you doing in there? Uh, I'm not doing very good. I hadn't uh, had a very good start, and I, I had a chance to, uh, what was it, the, the Homestead race. I, uh... If I remember correctly, I had a chance to win that race, and then something happened. I ended up getting taken out, and uh, even the guy that won that, he wasn't even in the top 25 in points. So I kind of came to the realization that even if I had won the race, I wouldn't have been in a. I'm not in a good enough position, I rating wise. Even if I wanted to go pro right now, I'm not. I'm not going to make it because I'm not in the the higher splits and gaining the the necessary points so i i don't even really know where i'm running at in points and at this point it's a moot subject speaking of yeah. that i was uh actually car number 40 in the third split with a 4094 i rating wow that just goes to show you how many big big guys are out there running for a shot at this i didn't realize it was that serious we got a driver uh, that's uh, sitting 55th overall with um, two races missed. Oh, wow, with two races missed. Wow. Well, uh, just to review this. Two. Well, looking at the standings now for, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's the top 10 get the automatic pro, right? The world t uh, license. And then... 11th through 20th qualify for the chance to qualify into the race every week. And uh, Bobby Zielinski is currently leading the Pro Series Championship with 1,306 points. Actually, and, Kyle, if you, if you look at the, um, there's a spreadsheet in there that accounts for all the drops and everything. That's more accurate than the actual eye racing one because it accounts for the uh, drops and it puts loser ahead of Zelensky and then draw behind him. Oh, okay. I wasn't yeah, aware of that. Handy. So it goes loser, Zelensky, draw, Blake Reynolds, Brian Schoenberg, Nolan Scott, Mullis, Allen, and Davis. And then the next 10 are uh, Bordeaux, Richardson, Kushiba, Hill, Joe Letterall, Malik, Kyle Putz, Nichols, Edison. I can't say Alexi's name, and then Brandon Pipgrass. Peter Bennett is just on the outside, which is interesting because he's an ex-pro running in, like, split four. Yeah, that's crazy. I know uh, Michael Ryan Michael Lewis has been on a tear the past couple of races and uh, been running, you know, leading some serious laps. The, the last two weeks that we've run this series, I did catch up uh, some uh, some replays of it. And, uh He's serious about it. He wants to be the top dog of all top dogs, I guess. So we'll see what happens here. He's got a lot of help behind him. He's got a good team. Yeah, yes, he does. Um, shout out to Nolan Scott. Um, I've been talking to him for a couple months now and, um, you know, getting some advice from him. He's he's a little higher up in I rating and, and trying to uh, figure out how I can get up there and, I see he's running up in the top 10 in the series. He did tell me earlier that he was planning on running for pro. So definitely good luck to him. And uh, I hope he keeps his uh, his streak going here and, and manages to get to his ultimate goal of running in the pro series next year. So, so 
All right. Well, I guess this this coming Tuesday night, if I'm not mistaken, at 9 p.m., we'll square off at Atlanta Motor Speedway in the Pro Series and see how the team does there. So stay tuned for the updates for that race. Yeah, look out at Atlanta. It's hot and slick. Oh, yeah. I'm already expecting that one. <laughs> Yeah, the fall off is going to be crazy. I see me and Jamie yeah. have already been working on a, something for that. All right. All right. Let's bring up the next topic here. Um, looks like the next thing we're going to talk about is the build. Yeah. And, uh, well, that should yeah. be quick. Well, they put out a message prior saying, you know, might as well hit it with you, basically, and tell you you're not getting dirt now. If we have it ready before the March build, we'll release it early. But um, I know there's a lot of people disappointed about it. I personally have been enjoying it every minute of all the crying because I'm one of those guys that just when it gets here, it gets here. You know, I'm personally not excited about dirt. Why? I raced on dirt before in real life and uh i could care less about it actually getting here it'll get here when it gets here and until they have its own license class for it i will never run an official race on it so and i'm more of an official racing kind of guy so we'll see but um otherwise on other notes um they did put some stuff in there about dirt and how they do have a lot of the major stuff done for it, but there's still some other tweaks that they want to um, take care of. They did say they had the 305, the 358, and the four Tejan versions of a super dirt late model. Um, the wingless dirt 410 sprint car, the winged sprint car, including the 305, 360, and 410. And they're putting them through the wind tunnel for better aero data, especially for the wing sprint car. Um, talked again about wanting to include Global Rally Cross later in the future and thanking the community for their patience. Uh, they released Time Attack. This new hot lapping competition feature we think is going to be a great fun. It will be something that almost everyone from rookies slash time constrained people to veteran sim racers will really enjoy we are also close on this new adventure and also would release that at some point in time not necessarily needing to wait until an actual season end build and they'll be doing a video about it soon to give uh, the community a better idea um, they're also still working on many other things that were discussed previously, like the new damage model, the new in-sim UI, the web interface, improved and new sounds, including working on utilizing X-Audio 2, animations and graphics, new forums, physics, incredible content, working on many other things that they haven't discussed yet. So... They still got a lot of work to do, and they just basically put the note out there saying... Sorry, no dirt this time. Um, I did notice that when it did come out, we'll probably catch up on that here shortly. But I did notice that the pit stop crews now seem to have some animation. What do you think about that, guys? I actually haven't even been on iRacing enough to notice. I've kind of taken a bit of a hiatus. Not the NIS season is over, taking a break. But uh, I've yet to see it yet. I've been on a lot, a real lot, and haven't haven't paid particular attention to it, honestly. But it looks pretty cool. I mean, if it, and some people are saying it doesn't work, but I, I haven't really paid enough attention to see. But I did notice the tire sound. Now, if I get somebody sliding across my hood like Bo or Luke Duke with a jack in their hand, I, I'm going to take notice. <laughs> Hey, you oh, guys just... notice the tire sound? No. I, I'm actually with Dave. I really haven't been on. I literally have not raced i on racing since the Pro Series race. Uh, well, I missed Auto Club, so the week before that. So they didn't tell anybody, I don't think, in the release notes, but they updated the tire sounds for, I don't know, for all the cars, but it, 
it seems like the new tire model has new tire sounds and when you're sliding in the tire it's actually sounding like a screeching tire now versus a grinding tire which is pretty good that's what I that also, was yeah that's the difference in the sound I've had some anomalies in tire temperatures that I have ongoing with iRacing staff that we sent some telemetry where we had 30 degree higher temperatures with the same chassis and the same room condition. So I don't know if it's our end or their end or what, but I have some data that I got sent over to them about that, which will be interesting to see if anything comes of it. Huh, interesting. I'm kind of wondering why we can't get a track bar adjustment yet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> True. <laughs> the GT1 cars, I don't know if you guys do these or not, but the GT1 cars had a huge change. The Corvette did. They changed the, um, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but the wing package or the aero package on the car. And now you got to run quite a bit more um, uh, downforce on the cars than you were running before. I think they're two notches higher on those than we were before. That's pretty yeah. cool. See, that's the interesting part as to why we don't have uh, track bar adjustments. Because in the Indy car, you know, you've got on the fly uh, adjustments you can do in an Indy car. In the V8 supercar, you've got your on the fly adjustments that you can make to your, to your roll bars or whatever. I mean, it, I, I'm struggling to understand how they can add the option to adjust a, a left rear offset but you can't adjust your, your track bars. Well, it requires them to rebuild. The, the kind of questions come up a few times, and it, re, it requires the team, the physics team, to actually reconstruct the code for the cars. So they basically have to rebuild the cars. Now, Eric Hudak isn't, at least on the staff, full-time is my understanding, but they had somebody else come in, and I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Bad with names, but they have a new oval guy in there, but it seems like all of the resources for oval right now are focused completely on dirt. And there's just a lot of, I get the sense from the forums and in the races and the participation and stuff, there's a lot of uh, unhappiness about the static situation in oval. Well, yeah, I can agree. I can agree with that. Um, I don't know if it's static. I, you know, I think the the NASCAR side of things, you know, they they're pretty much where they need to be. Uh, I'd be interested to see when we get the new aero package for the Gen Six, if that's before the Daytona 500 or not. That'd be uh, something I'm looking for seeing when that happens. Which I don't think they'll it, they'll get it by Daytona. Uh, it'll probably be uh, a little later than that, which is disappointing because I'd like to be able to just start the year on the aero package that we're you know we're going to run the rest of the season and just you know get our feet wet with, with, with it and be done with it instead of having to you know do five or six races into the season. Then we get a new aero package. We got to start from scratch on. When the second race of the season make more sense. Yeah. Right. We're yeah, missing we Eric Kudak. I mean, that's the problem, I feel like. I'm the, there's no presence from... Eric used to be on the forums a lot. I mean, I got a lot of answers from Eric that are not... Because iRacing is not easy to find answers on how they do things. And Eric would pop in there a lot and answer questions. So I feel like we're missing that quite a bit. And it's hard. It's really difficult. Didn't we go through that? Maybe I'm wrong, but didn't we go through that this past NIS? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we started out with yeah. the 2015 Arrow package, and then we got into 10, 15 races into the season, roughly, give or take, and then we ended up going to a 2016 Arrow package. Yeah, that's what it was, because I remember we had basically had to... The loose cars because of Wait, the downforce. Pretty sure it changed in uh, after Atlanta, which is like yeah, the third like race. Five weeks. Five yeah. races, I mean. Okay, so my estimations were a bit skewed, but you know. I think because we have a setup for Atlanta, but it's from pre um, this build, I guess. You know, this downforce model. Right. Yeah, after I said that, it, I, 
made more sense to me that it wasn't that many races in. All right. Well, as far as the release notes um, for this season coming out, season one, um, some of the highlights, the world state triple buffering that should eliminate some of the frame rate choppiness. Um, replays can now record voice chat. I know there's some people on the team that are absolutely ecstatic about this. Um, this is going to make protests um, a lot nicer, especially when you have guys that claim that you said something that you didn't say. And <laughs> Nim's so... inbox just got full. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure Nim's <laughs> inbox was like, like actually got time full. to test this. Oh, yeah. You can actually test it yourself by just going in there to say something over the chat, and there'll be a little icon there next to your rewind play button or whatever. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, you can see it there and listen to yourself. You kind of knew Has... it was coming because the video replays captured all your audio, so it's not surprising. Well, shout out to Nim, hashtag lit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what else? The heat haze effect. I. Saw a video where they were trying to show the heat haze effect and the um, animated pit crews. I definitely saw the animated pit crews. It looks like the pit crew members are basically talking with each other now on pit road instead of just standing there as a two-dimensional figure. Um, but I didn't. I can't really tell from the video that I saw the heat haze effect. So. I guess I'll have to uh, oh, pay with, attention to that later. Even without the video, it's very, very minimal. I yeah. haven't been able to notice it. I did a video too on that, and trying to point it out and looking at it. You know, we pointed an arrow where the general area of it was, and it was I could barely see it myself before I recorded the thing, so it's very minimal. If you take your camera and you set it down on the track, like when you're trying to look at the front splitter type of thing, and then oh. just slide the camera either to the right or to the left of the car, and you'll be able to see it in the background. Yeah, but how noticeable is it going to be when you're actually racing? For right now, probably not a lot. But in the roadside, when you do the or in the oval side, when we do the day to night transitions, I would expect that is going to be pretty prevalent. Yeah, if they ever get here. Yeah, but you can see them putting in pieces of it to get to that solution. You know. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, animated support characters, which and additional spotter commands, which okay, that's all right. I'd rather see some less chatty spotters, but uh, visor tear offs. So just a, another step in the right direction towards dirt. Uh, hand over hand steering for some vehicles. Telemetry upgrades. Um, For telemetry people, the the, the um, frequency and the telemetry upgrades are a big deal. Right, yes. They got the new V8 supercar tires and the new peripheral lighting functionality. So that's just some of the stuff that they updated or tweaked. Um, well, the they did supercar this... is actually noticeable. Yeah, so we talked about this just a few minutes ago. They did say the new V8 supercar tires, but maybe they should have said that there was more than just the V8 supercar tires for sounds. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing a little clip of the visor tear off. Pretty much right. a lot of people are saying that it's very minor, but you can actually get the windshield or your whatever all dirty, the helmet all dirty, and you, if you slow it down like a replay, you can actually see it peeling slowly off. Yeah, I see, oh, I see what you're cool. doing there on the stream, yeah. you could, I can tell the difference. Oh yeah, well it took me forever to get that amount of dirt by myself. Oh. <laughs> but I'm sure if somebody, like, goes off the track in front of you, the dirt will probably collect faster on your car. But trying to do it yourself is just 
I don't know. It doesn't collect really quick. It takes quite a while. Huh. I was there going back and forth to the Laguna Seca trying to get as much dirt as I can on the thing before I peeled the tear off. Oh, okay. Alright, well, the next thing that we're going to bring up is a forum post. Looks to be about force feedback. Time to update the force feedback physics rate in iRacing. Um, Clayton MacLeod made a forum post about force feedback, and it's quite a... That's just like rolling a grenade into a room. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was quite a detailed post that he put up there. But you got to give know. David Tucker credit. I mean, he, he's, he's stuck in there. That, that was a tough crowd. I know I'm part of that crowd, and that's a tough crowd to deal with. I've had a lot of conversations with David on the side. And you can, he's a really patient person. I give him a lot of credit. Right. Um... Mike actually put this in the notes, and he had a couple small points that he wanted to make regarding this, so I'll read them for you. Uh, one is that faster feed, force feedback would always be better, assuming you can maintain a steady upgrade, update rate. However, the question is not, is not, is it better, but is it worth the effort? Remember that we could theoretically run at one kilohertz or faster, but that would be a colossal waste of effort given the current state of the industry. The up, the hardware is not up to the challenge. Yeah, that's As a I quote said, right from David Tucker's um, post. Right. As I said before, the main benefits would be in a small improvement to wheel stability, especially when parked on pit road, and a little bit, a little more new nuisanced effect when going over curves because they cause a large but detailed change in the force feedback. So that must be what Mike did as he put David uh, yeah, Tucker's, put Tucker's about, quote right in there. Yeah. Another one that he said was in practice the benefits are much smaller than any of, the, of you imagined them to be. I did a lot of back-to-back -back testing and I could hardly tell the difference between 60 and 180 hertz. In fact, in a blind test, I would, I probably would not have felt a difference at all. Uh, he said, I want for, faster force feedback to work as much as any of you, so I am biasing myself. As Clayton and others have pointed out, the wheels can't reproduce fast signals or latency is probably the lowest in the industry, and that is far more important than a faster update rate. And outside of transient events, i.e. bumps, the signals coming from the road are low frequency, which are less than 20 hertz. I'm going to jump in on this quick because I think there's a couple of counterpoints that are somewhat valid. And I think David even would would acknowledge this, that David isn't um, Johnny. David isn't uh, Rhea Fala. So, yes, David knows the data. David knows the inputs, he understands the hardware, the software, the programming, everything behind it. But I have to agree a little bit with the guys who are at a level of, I guess we'll call them aliens, because that's what everybody refers to them as. But what happens when you put an alien in David's office and he does the blind test? That's what I'd like to know. I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but if he's not an Araya fellow, can he make that judgment? All right, I see your argument there. True. Heated well, debate I... in the forum, though. Whew. Oh, that that was definitely uh, quite the forum. <laughs> There's houses of popcorn in there, I think. Definitely. <laughs> um, so it's, I guess we'll leave that to what it is. Uh, they had quite the debate on there, and we thought we would bring it up and talk about it a little bit on the, on the show. Um, next, we're going to touch real quick on a comment that we received on episode 53, uh, Sim Racing Chewy Side, uh, episode 53. Gaftastic said, can you guys talk about the new format for C-Fixed and B-Fixed? From what I read in the release notes, it sounds like it will run all year like NIS. 
I have not read that. I have no idea. Dave, do you know? Carlos, maybe? I haven't seen this mentioned anywhere. As I was pawing through uh, the release notes and stuff, and maybe I missed it, but I haven't seen. Now, I do know that they're currently doing this. Um, I don't know if there's any changes to it, and that's what he's commenting about, but yeah, the the C open and the B open, they run similar to what the NIS series does, but they have more time slots. I think their time slots are open for that week of racing. They don't have specific time slots, so it runs like a uh, like a C fixed or a B fixed race, but it follows the complete schedule. Now, currently, the C-Fixed and B-Fixed, they run a, a, a fictional schedule. They don't uh, always A 13-week. Right. Right, a 13-week schedule instead of the, the full race schedule. And so I think they're, they're maybe thinking about transitioning over so that everything is running a uh, full schedule without and, and counting it as... Uh, a uh, one season schedule deal instead of 13 week uh, increments. Right. Now, I knew or the no, C it'd be the 12 B week. 12 week increments. Right. 12. Yeah. That's what I meant to say earlier. I knew C and B open ran already year round or for the full year length. That's why it threw me off when they said C and B fixed. I didn't see anything in the notes myself. Maybe I missed it as well. But. Maybe, like you said, they are just going to make everything across the board run like that. Who knows? I guess uh, we'll see later. Which I wouldn't mind. I really wouldn't mind it if it was a single season throughout the duration of the year. And, you know, and you're racing for points through the whole season like you do in NIS instead of it just, you know, showing up when you want to and run what you want and not run what you want. I mean, if you run for a championship, you're going to be more consistent no matter what series it is if it's a full race season. Yeah, and I would think that that would take a little bit of stress off of uh, iRacing or the programmers, I guess it would be, where they don't have to worry about putting in a new 12-week schedule all the time where they could just do up a 36-week a schedule and let it fly, you know what I mean? So right. maybe maybe uh, it might be a smarter idea. I don't know. We'll see. That, I think, would produce a little bit more consistency in the lower series because you're going to have people that are actually running for a full season championship. Yeah, I can't True. imagine them. I just can't imagine them doing that with the – that basically puts the entire top three oval series on hiatus, and I just can't imagine that that's a good idea. Right now, do you have the C and B fix running every day, and there's people in there, and all the people in the NIS, the other half of the service, so to speak, are kind of on hiatus. There's, I'd be, I'm not sure that they would really do that to put all of Oval more or less off for the winter, because there's a lot of people who don't run the entire NIS. They they come on here to race 12 week seasons, especially right, with well, leagues. You're, you're correct in that sense, and so there's valid points uh, on both sides of it. I think what would happen for this to work is you'd have to have m maybe the C fixed and the B fixed. Uh, if there's an off week for that series, you, you'd toss in some sort of random race. And then in the off season, during the winter months, I think you would open up B and see fixed back to the old format um, similar the way the, the A open and the A fixed run separate yeah. from the NIS. They need a winter series for people who right, don't want exactly. to be involved. Yeah. So I think yeah. for it to work you'd have to have two different formats for for the off weeks and then also for the uh, the winter break. But I mean, they could make it work. Yeah. I guess time will tell what they're really planning on doing.
Uh, next up, uh, a bunch of Twitter posts about dirt. <laughs> um, <And> next. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to elaborate there, Kyle, too much. I know. <laughs> you read my mind, but you know, they did they put out a uh a photo of fireworks going off at Eldora Speedway with the the dirt late bottle up on uh Victory Lane there. Uh, what else did they put up? They put up uh Some uh, other photos regarding it. There's just a bunch of Twitter posts about dirt. They are making sure they're keeping the hype as real as possible about this dirt. Um, it looks like these were mostly posted after they kind of came out and said, hey, we're not releasing dirt right now. But then they started throwing it back out there like dirt's coming, dirt's coming. Don't worry, it's coming. So... Dirt's coming. That's about all I got to say. Well, well the problem I mean, is... Kind of, dirt's coming. I mean, the good thing about it is, is it's going to draw a whole another flock of, of racers if they do the marketing well. If they bring in the... If it brings in, you know, five, ten thousand, whatever people to iRacing, that's for our subscriptions. That's a better sim racing community. It's, you know, it's a whole other side of the service it's it's good for everybody i mean as long as it doesn't dilute what we already have which some of that will happen but i think you'll get crossover i mean expanding i racing and expanding what they do just makes it more palatable to more people and i think it's great it's tough that they don't have the resources to handle asphalt oval dirt oval and road and all these things all at once because you can kind of see the peaks and valleys on each side when they're focusing on stuff but well you know, that's another thing that, that dirt is going to bring. Is you've got, you know, the dirt oval guys that are, you know, coming in new to iRacing. That's new subscriptions. That's more money in iRacing's pocket, which means there's more availability to put that money into resources. And, I mean, so, yeah, um, even the road guys. As much as they could care less about dirt, at the end of the day, if dirt is bringing in money to iRacing, those road guys are going to benefit from it one way or the other because iRacing is able to invest more money into other resources to advance their programs. If they get rally cross, I mean, that's it's a whole other group of people. Right, exactly. Finns love that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that I think do. it's going to benefit everybody, honestly. I think the reason why I'm not hyped about it is the whole license class thing. But other than that, I think that it's going to bring a whole new crowd. There is going to be a huge swarm wave of new subscriptions. I'm not talking about resubscribes or, you know, renewals of subscriptions. I'm talking there's going to be a whole swarm of people signing up for iRacing for the very first time because Dirt's coming out. I look at it as a standpoint of Dirt's coming out. All those subscriptions that they're going to add, they're going to be able to keep this rate, the subscription rate down to keep all these guys that got so hurt about a dollar raise and uh, monthly subscription fees at bay. And uh, like Dave said, I think it's more money coming in to continue bringing us some of the greatest content that we've had to date. I don't think that they've released anything where it's really gone backwards. So I look forward to it from that, st from that standpoint. And I'm sure someday I'll jump on the dirt wagon, but just not today. Well, the, the challenging part is, is hoping iRacing gets it out before Scott Bloomcrest requires because if Scott Bloomquist retires and he retires and he gets uh, gets wind of uh, dirt late model on i racing, he's going to get on here and he's going to drag all of us around the track. And that would be fun. Bring Steve Kinzer too. I'd love to see him on too. Right. I mean, dirt's a compl. Dirt is actually a, when you think about the physics side of dirt. All right. The physics. It's dynamic dirt and ever changing. But asphalt is actually far more complicated than dirt is. When you look at how the science and the physics behind it are put together, 
you're talking about like liquid bitumen, um, different aggregates, different um, admixtures, different thicknesses. The, the heat the heat plays such a major component to uh, asphalt compared to dirt. The pavement and asphalt racing, not that it's more or less important, but it's a lot harder to really understand the science behind it. And it's different everywhere in the country. I mean, dirt's different everywhere in the country too, I suppose, but ultimately most dirt tracks are looking to get a clay surface. But you can actually dissect a dirt track a lot easier with a lot less experience than you can an asphalt track. Right. True. And I, I will agree with you a little bit, but uh, temperature, for example, just to counter that argument, uh, that's um, it's key to dirt racing, but it, it differs from what it is to uh, oval racing. You know, for oval racing, you know, your, your track temperatures affect your, your, your tires and the amount of grip, but that same thing is true in dirt. Uh, not only does the temperatures in your tire affect your grip, but the temperature in the track actually not only affects the track's grip, but it uh, it changes the surface dynamic because as the track dries out, the track gets slicker. You know, uh, the, uh, the pavement side of that, you've got one surface it, it, it's dry pavement with oh, dirt but it's not dave an asphalt when you look at the groove the the parts of the aggregate in the asphalt are worn and it's like looking at 20 grit paper versus 120 grit paper in the groove the 20 grit asphalt takes the rubber from the tires and you just chews them up and then it turns into a, a different surface than out of the groove and that's one of my complaints with i racing is and i racing asphalt is asphalt it's really not okay. you know, these different I, things. They're fixing that in dirt, though. From what I've seen, they're paying a lot of attention to the actual composition of the soil, and that's pretty exciting. I, I hope they're doing soil samples. I hope they're getting sieve analysis. I hope they're doing moisture content analysis, you know, additives, looking at the stuff that they put down on, on the track to keep them dry, looking at particle size and things like that, because that matters. That controls the physics and the movement of the dirt itself and how much rubber it takes it'll be interesting well and i think uh the the pavement side you know will benefit more so down the road after they really get their finger on the pulse of dirt you know there's going to be some of that stuff that they're going to be able to you know bring over and uh more of the dynamic side of a track they'll be able to more implement on on the pavement oh i guess it's an exciting thing all around like all we can do is sit here and wait for it to happen so stay tuned Hashtag for that. <laughs> definitely all right next up is the All Star Race, I Racing All Star Race. Um, he said uh, Hugo Lewis put up a post after a bit of a delay. We're pleased to announce the return of the I Racing All Star Race, which is being organized by uh, us lot at Race Spot TV. The concept is very simple: get someone of I get some of I Racing's best sim racers and pit them against each other in a fun event to run out run out the year. Uh, this year, they're going to do one road and one oval race, both utilizing fixed setups. Uh, they wanted to utilize one venue for both events, so they chose New Hampshire Motor Speedway as their race course of choice. Race details, December 17th, 2016, 7 p.m. GMT, or 2 p.m. Eastern, for the, roval, for the road race, and 8 p.m. GMT, or 3 p.m. Eastern, for the oval race. Uh, track is obviously New Hampshire Oval Road Course. The car is the late model Chevy Monte Carlo SS, and the weather will be dynamic. To be eligible, you will have to have won a race in either the NASCAR Peak Antifreeze Series 
Uh, the IWCGPS, I believe that would be the Road Series, if I'm not mistaken, or the BGTS Series, Blake Payne, uh, has finished in the top 10 of either of those three series, or won an, an iRacing Special Endurance event this year top split. Uh, he provided a detailed eligibility list, which you can click on on the forum. Uh, if your team is in the list and was not invited, please contact him. And they've not included the winners for the Pro Series as of uh, as these series are still in progress. So the Pro Series will not count. Yeah, it should be an interesting watch. See, uh, see what those uh, those road guys can do when they get put on an oval against the oval's best, and and vice versa. Oh, it looks like you could probably run the race that you want to. So if road wanted to run road, they could, I guess, because they start an hour apart from each other. How many laps are they? I didn't uh, catch. No, that. I I think the idea is is you're putting road guys and oval guys together on oval. And then you're going to switch it up, and they're all going to run on road. Oh, okay. So it's going to be a shorter race. Right, yeah. It's going to be shorter race lengths, I would assume. All right. Just a little fun run type of deal. All right. Well, the prize, they say, is instead of awarding a winner with a prize, they're going to donate $100 to the winner's chosen charity or cause of choice. This should be either register, either a registered charity or a legitimate cause designed to help an individual or group's well-being. So check it out. If you're interested in running, check and make sure you're eligible and uh, try and get into it. They're only accepting the first 43 people into the server. And he said there's about 100 people eligible. So if you want to run it and you're eligible, Definitely get in there and see what you got against some of the other guys of uh, top level standards. Yeah, just a, something to throw out there, you know, being that that's run for charity, uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea for uh, the participants to maybe uh, all pitch in a couple bucks and, and raise that pot for a good cause. Hey, reach out to the charity and see if you can get permission to run them on their car. Who knows? Right. All right. Uh... Wouldn't actually even be a bad thing for, for uh, if iRacing can figure out a way for members, you know, if members wanted to uh, throw into the pot for a good cause. True. Uh, short note. Please be courteous and respectful for all of your fellow competitors. Vulgarity and abusive language is not allowed no matter the circumstances. Have a great race. Not sure. That oh, it was says added... it shows now as you enter a race. Yes, that's what you see uh, at your, your waiting screen before you join a race. They're yes. trying to uh, advocate uh, a little bit more respect in the, the racing environment. Which Eight. has gotten a bit ridiculous as of late. I wonder if uh, Nib's trying to take a vacation or something. So, <laughs> so he had this added to the service. Who knows? Maybe because I'll agree. I think that I don't know if it was a matter of the wind down of the NIS season, 36 weeks, and everybody's tired and frustrated, or what it is. But it seems like these past two months have gotten just out of control with behavior and any split that I've seen coverage of or been in myself. It is not a game. It's a sim. But we're all here to have fun. Accidents happen. Chill out. <laughs> I mean, well, you know what it turns <sighs> out to be? People get to fighting like they're a married couple. I guess that's what happens after you race you know, a, a full season together. You 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 see a lot of the same names and uh, I, I I don't mind uh, a a little bit of banter back and forth like you know 
you know, the, the, the simple stuff, but, you know, the, the name calling and, and putting people down, you know, some of this stuff is just unacceptable. I, I can get, you know, a, a little bit of an argument back and forth, you know, who did who wrong, but, you know, as long as it's a civil back and forth, that's fine. But, you know, a lot of people, they take it way past being civil. I get a lot of heat on the forums for uh, trying to encourage people to act professional. I think even one time I was, re at least once if not twice, I've been suggested that if only I could be their daddy. <laughs> huh. And well, that yeah. this is their playground. Oh, boy. This is just, that's like, really? It's like, yes, it's, there's a, if you're going to not be fun about it and you're not going to be professional about it, those seem like two acceptable approaches. Even nonchalant is a good approach. But that approach? I guess teach their own, you know? Well, Maybe that's I won't make those kind of comments it. anymore about being professional, I guess, if that's what it comes down to. Right. Well, one of the big problems is the Internet as a whole is disrespectful. You know, I mean, you go on YouTube and you, you could watch some kid's video on YouTube you could scroll down through the comments and you're going to find a comment in there. I almost guarantee you that it is just blatantly disrespectful and unwarranted. It's, you know, the, the attitude towards people on the internet is just, it's awful. Yeah. I know that one subscriber I follow on YouTube watched every single video he's ever posted he's got his trolls that he gets that they probably don't even watch the video they literally just show up to throw some sort of sarcasm on there it's like you said it's today's internet today's society grow up moving on from that topic uh somebody made a forum post with phil lee i guess it would be he put up how he did a quick test using his Logitech G8 G810 keyboard and got it to work for uh, shifting lights with the LEDs across the F keys from F1 to F10. Kind of neat, actually, when I look at it. That's interesting. That is really cool. There's some super smart people on here, that's for sure. I don't know. My eyes are always so focused on the screen that I don't. I probably wouldn't notice it. My G27 has those same lights on the rim, and I don't ever notice them. So I, I wouldn't do it personally because I just don't ever look at my keyboard while I'm racing. But still a neat concept that he did that. Cool to look at. Honestly, looks like something Dave Smith would have figured out a long time ago because he tinkers with everything that he can get his hands on. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about iRacing is they've got a lot of stuff in the background to drive all sorts of fancy gizmos and gadgets. You just got to, you know, figure out how to put two and two together. And I mean, there's a lot of possibilities still out there that I don't think we've really seen much of. I know John probably uh, um, could uh, relate to uh, what I'm talking about with, with telemetry and everything. If there's there's a lot of stuff in the background. You just got to figure out how to how to use it and, uh, you know, put it out there into uh, something useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> it in all reality, everything's always going to be evolving. There's always going to be a newer version of the older. So it's always just a matter of what the new thing is going to be tomorrow that's going to make today old. <sighs> now, if only I could just take and go and buy like a, a Corvette off the lot, pull the motor out, put my computer in the engine bay, plug it all in. And, and just go on iRacing, I mean, that'd be, we'd be all set. 
<laughs> Did you happen to catch uh, last week's episode when we talked about that that young gentleman that actually has a, a car in his room with Leo Bodner set up on it? And I mean, uh, his whole yeah. room is decked out, man. I caught I that. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, have he, to check he, out yeah. that video. It was awesome. <laughs> Uh, moving on, iRacing announced the roar before the 24. It's going to be a 2.4 hour solo event running January 13th to the 15th and more details to follow. Uh, race times are going to be, uh, they came out with multiple sessions again. This is a bummer. Well, uh, this is the roar before, so this is a solo event. Uh, you, you, it's just yourself driving the car for the 2.4 hours. So yeah. being that there's multiple time slots, that's acceptable for this race. I'll go with that. Yeah, it's going to be the January 13th through the 15th at Daytona Road, late afternoon. Length of the race is 144 minutes or translated to two hours, 24 minutes. There's going to be four time slots Saturday at or I'm sorry, Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern, Saturday, 8 a.m. Eastern, Saturday, 12 p.m. noon Eastern, and Sunday, 9 a.m. Eastern. Your cars to choose from are the Kia Optima, the Ford Mustang, or the Global Mazda MX-5 Cup. There will be more info to come, so stay tuned for that. And the last topic of the evening. Tony Tony Gardner posting on a forum post. Uh, what was this regarding? I'm sorry, guys. I want to see a pace car or something. Or no. Or oh, like it was dirt. for the pace car for dirt. And Tony said it will be a standard pickup truck pace car for dirt, hopefully. Art guys are working on it. We are working on trying to figure out how we can pick a pace car by series. So, looks like maybe not That'll just fix for the dirt. Porsche Noval, huh? <laughs> yeah. You know about the Porsche yeah. Noval, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... Is he touching on maybe switching it to a different pace car based on the actual yeah. series? Yeah, that yeah. uh, sounds like the way they're going, thankfully. That'll be cool. Oh, wow. That that will be neat. It'd be cool if they actually did it um, kind of more real to life, so to speak. All right. I guess that's going to wrap up the show topics. We'll move into final thoughts. Dave, do you have anything? Um, well, normally at this point in time, I'd say I'm looking forward to the next NIS race, but, uh, there isn't a, a, a race. So, uh, I guess the only race I'm probably going to end up doing is the, uh, the pro race here coming up on uh, Tuesday and, uh, that'll be it. Can't wait until the, the new NIS season starts. I'm already getting the itch. Yeah. Carlos, anything? Nope. Oh. John, how about you? Yeah, it's funny. Dave mentions the NIS, actually, because I was going to mention that I'm trying to be the liaison between uh, the NIS group and iRacing staff with Tony Gardner. I've worked, I've coordinated with Tony on some stuff in the past, and we have a process. And I think if we follow through with this polling process, people will participate. We get 200 votes. If people uh, would go there and vote on what they would like to see happen, I could send over those results and we could actually at least propose what we'd like to see. So I'm excited and I'm hoping people are excited about it because there's a lot of complaining about it. And if you're going to complain about it and not do anything about it, then you're kind of part of the problem. So check now out the forums. Is... Okay, so you, this is actively ongoing on the forums right now. Yep, the polling for some of the stuff has concluded because we almost we got 300 votes on some of the stuff. But get your friends together, get who your teammates together, get whoever you race with, and get over there and say your piece. 
And this can be found under the uh, NASCAR iRacing Series category on the forums? Yep, under the NIS page. Okay, awesome. Oh, I've said it always. If you don't voice a vote, you don't voice an opinion. I have no right to bitch if you don't uh, put your opinion in the pot. Um, I guess I'm the only one left for final thoughts. I said it a couple weeks ago that I was ready to take a break, but I think I'm with you, Dave. It's been a couple weeks. I miss racing. <laughs> Not quite enough to say that I want to start tomorrow, but um, I've been enjoying the vacation. I've been doing some streaming on my personal channel of other games that I enjoy playing. And uh, other than that, I'm just looking forward to running Tuesday night and packing the race shoes away for a week. And that's about it. So, Should we uh, mention the times changing for our podcast? Yep. Yep. Was just going to bring that up. Um, just one final thought. Um, dirt's coming soon, so stay tuned for those details. Uh, the podcast has moved to Saturday Records, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also catch it live at that time on twitch.tv forward slash iRacers Lounge, as all of our records are broadcast live on Twitch. And the release will be normally, I would have to say Sunday, but possibly Mondays um, on all the other venues that you can catch us on. You can contact the team at any time uh, at iRacers Lounge on Twitter, Facebook. You can go to our website, iRacersLounge.com, our YouTube channel at iRacers Lounge. Uh, if you have any questions, you can get a hold of us there or even on our team page at Team Tyfosi Racing on Facebook. Catch the podcast anytime on SoundCloud, Stitcher, PodTrack, iTunes, Spreaker, pretty much any major uh, podcast hosting site out there. If you have any show topics that you'd like to have discussed by us on the, on the live show, definitely reach out to us and get them to us. Um, we covered one or two tonight. We definitely read through comments, and we read comments on the live broadcast as well. So if you have something that you want to touch on, definitely reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to talk about it. So until next time, take care. See ya. Thank you for listening to the iRacers Lounge Podcast. Make sure to go subscribe to us at our YouTube channel at iRacers Lounge. Follow on Twitter and Facebook at iRacers Lounge and SoundCloud at iRacers Lounge. See you on the track.